Dude, this is not this is not your time. Go inside. Go Seattle. <laughs> I gotta do this. Go, come on. Go. Get out of here. Come here. Hey. Get. <laughs> yes. I'll start it. Hey, this is Dr. Brendan McCarthy. I am the Chief Medical Officer of Protea Medical Center in Chandler, Arizona. Thank you so much for tuning into my podcast. Um, I start every podcast the same way. Every one of the podca- these podcasts, excuse me, every one of these podcasts I get ready for in advance and I get excited about them. It gives me an opportunity to go back and research into the things that I do every day in my work. And it's just... Um, it's a pleasure to do. I really love my job. I love what I do. And the opportunity to spend time researching into it is just, you know, bonus. So whenever I do that, I like to put citations down in the description section of the video. Please look at the description section. Um, to this video, you'll see the citations, the research that I read getting ready for today. It, sometimes if the video just drops and those citations are not in there, that's me. I'll put them up there, I promise. I usually, sometimes I'm a little bit behind. I'll put them in there within the week. But uh, yeah, so please, if you're interested in doing more research into this material, it's there. And then uh, today's subject, we're going to be talking about breast health. And that is an important thing to understand for women. It's something that's so misunderstood and it's something that's so terrifying for many of you. And, and I know that. Some women look at their breasts as, as ticking time bombs. Anytime there's pain or any kind of irregularities, it, it just creates so much fear. And it's because there's so much that's unknown. So many of you there's been so little outreach and education from medicine to you to explain what happens to your breasts. What goes on with Why are they swollen? Why do they hurt? Is this normal? So um, this is something that I've learned clinically. And this is something that I've seen just constantly. And, And I had no idea until I started practicing medicine how much of a stress this caused. So, so I wanted to jump right in and um, say, you know, the issue with this, a couple things. You know, one of the issues with this, as I mentioned, there's such a gray area in your health. There's too little information that you can trust or that you're even given medically. Mostly you're just told at 50 years old, you get your mammogram and that's about it. And they don't really walk you through what a mammogram is telling them. I mean, I remember reading mammograms to women and talking about what I'm seeing in the reports. And they had never heard that before. No one's ever sat down. Usually you're just used to someone saying, your mammogram's, your mammogram's fine. You're good. I'll test you in two years. Or maybe I'll test you in a year. Or something worse, like I need you to come in and talk about this right away. But no one ever sat you down and said, this is what we're seeing. This is what the image looks like and this is what it means. That I think is essential. And I think it's important that every doctor takes that moment to sit down with you and go over what your breast health is with the imaging. Um, A lot of things I think is, is with most things with medicine, women are conditioned to accept this lack of care. So many women, and the the, the topic today really, it's not just breast health. I'm really going to go into breast pain. So many women have breast pain every month and have no idea why. And they're conditioned to believe that that's normal. And they go to their doctor and like, I'm having breast pain. And a lot of times they're just dismissed. Again, I feel like that's a refrain from all my videos. I just say, they go to their doctor and they say, this is happening and they're dismissed. I think I say that at every single podcast. <sighs> yeah. I'm not lying. So what is a better way of approaching this? Let me say this to start. Breast pain in my practice as a physician is never okay. On so many fronts. You should never have breast pain, ever. And I'm telling you this honestly as a physician, that is the goal always. And it should always be the goal. 
And it's one of those things I circle back to with my patients until it's gone. Now, sometimes there will be a month where things shift a little too much and you're going to have breast pain no matter what. There's always a chance of maybe that one breakaway month, but that should be an incredible rarity. It should not be the regular. So let's understand what happens with breast pain. Let's go back to the pathways that create this. And in order to do that, we have to talk about hormones again, which is <laughs> another thing I say in every podcast. One of these days, I want to talk about food. We were talking about, me and, me and Justin were talking about doing a podcast series on cooking, because I love to cook. So I might do one on cooking soon. That way, I'll, there'll be less talk on hormones, I promise. I'll try and switch it up a little bit. But back to breast health and, and the cause and to the hormone balance. There are two major hormones I want to talk about with breast health, and that's estrogen and progesterone, and specifically estradiol and and testosterone. Excuse me, estradiol and progesterone. So the first half of your cycle, the first two weeks, estradiol is more dominant, and estradiol. The role of estradiol is to stimulate all that tissue in your body to get it ready for conceiving. That's what every cycle is for. The idea is you're going to conceive, even though you're not going to. It still is how your body works. So estrogen stimulates breast tissue, the line of the uterus, cervix, stimulates your adipose. It's just, and then it also stimulates the ovaries themselves to even make more even, even more estrogen. And it's a feed forward loop for that. And then around day 12, ideally, you will ovulate. You hit a crescendo of estrogen and that triggers ovulation. And then estrogen drops down a progesterone steps in. Now, progesterone goes back to that tissue and calms down that stimulation. It reverses it in some cases and matures it in others. The lining of the uterus stops becoming too thick. It becomes more organized, better blood flow to the circulation to the tissue. Uh, we see it goes to the breast tissue and it stops that epithelial stimulation and, and, and reverses that. It calms it down. So it stops that stimulation of the tissue. That's the relationship. First half of the cycle, proliferative. Second half of the cycle, manage it, balance it, okay? So when you have a woman who has breast pain and, and, and the first thing you think of as a physician with breast pain is what is that estrogen doing? What is that progesterone doing? First thing, every time, run the labs, where are they? So you'll want to run a day 21 around there of their cycle. If some women have a longer cycle, you kind of calculate where it should be around the, it's called luteal phase, where you expect the progesterone to be at its apex. So there's ways of calculating for that. So I know some women have irregular cycles and some women have, you know, shorter or longer. And there are reasons for that, which I should do a podcast on that. I will do a podcast on that. That's a good one. Um, but you want to figure that out where that progesterone would be ideal and you run the lab then. And you want to see where the progesterone levels are relative to estradiol. That'll give you an idea whether they're ovulating and whether the progesterone levels are too low. Because that's the most common cause of breast pain. Is anovulatory cycles, which means you did not ovulate at that cycle. Progesterone levels are too low. Estrogen levels are dominant. High. Breast tissue is stimulated all month long. And at that point, you're going to have those women, they're just tissues going to be swollen. They're maybe a little bit larger than normal, be maybe a half a cup size larger. And it's just irritating. It's painful. And then when they have their period, it goes away because estrogen dropped back down. Everything went back down and became quiescent again. Why is it not okay to have breast pain? Why is it not okay to have breast pain? Other than just you're a human being, for the love of God, you should never have pain. You shouldn't have pain, you know? And I shouldn't give you an analgesic or a pain medication. I should figure out why you're in pain. You know, that's my job. So why, why is it bad? Well, one is the more months you have this estrogen dominance and progesterone deficiency, the more your breast tissue is going to change. And you're going to see more fibrotic changes in your breasts. Um, on a personal note, you know, a personal way this has affected me or in my, 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 my life my wife, when we first started dating, you know, had a fibroadenoma, which is again that she was ovulating, uh, was not ovulating. She was not ovulating, and and she had estrogen dominance, and that was causing this this fibrotic change happening in her breast tissue. That came from month after month of estrogen without progesterone. And talk about terror. Here you are, in your twenties. 
think you have breast cancer because there's a lump on your breast in the outer quadrant, which is that's where it all says where it's going to be. And, and there was no explanation to her ever, even after they did the biopsy, that estrogen causes this. And that unbalanced estrogen progesterone leads to this. Even though, and if you pause the video right now and just Google it, I'm not even talking to use a medical textbook, I'm just Google it. That's what it is. That's what's happening. So every month, a woman has estrogen dominance without ovulating with breast pain. They're going to see that changes in breast tissue becoming more fibrotic. We know in medicine that these fibrocystic changes in the breasts long-term leads to breast cancer risks that are elevated. There are studies that show that women who have over 60 months of consistent breast pain are at a much higher risk for breast cancer. And again, that'll be in the citations. Now, that study was done in France, and there's been other ones since. But in America, a lot of times you go to your doctor, like, no, breast pain doesn't lead to breast cancer. Again, let's be logical together for a minute. We know having a cycle with too much estrogen consistently over and over again is going to cause the breast tissue to become more fibrotic and you see that fibrocystic changes in your breasts. We also know that women who have more fibrocystic changes in their breasts have a higher risk factors for breast cancer. That's a fact. We know that women who have fibrocystic changes in their breasts have the highest incidence of breast pain. That's a fact. So when you're dismissed at the doctor's office, there's always people that will dismiss you. It's not, it's more important that we become curious and not confrontational in those settings. Our curiosity would be, why am I having breast pain? And the curiosity of the doctor's part, why are you having breast pain? Let's figure this out together. Instead of being dismissed, it's important to find someone that's going to be curious with you and understand it. Because you shouldn't be dismissed. And breast pain, it can be terrifying. And finding, finding a, a lump on your breast is terrifying. I've had so many phone calls with patients when they were worried. And I've sat in the room with patients who are worried. And I've sat in the room with patients when we found out they had breast cancer. I've, I've been through all of it. Even small things like this, to prevent any risk, is worth every effort. So how do we how do we how do we approach this? You know, um, our goal as a physician first is to stabilize the cycle. That's what we got to do. Always first and foremost, run the labs, figure out where they are in their cycle, figure out why they're not ovulating. Can you pause this for a second? Mm -hmm. There's something insane happening in my house. So how do we approach this? What's our goal in these cases? What am I looking for? So as I mentioned, we're going to look at that estrogen progesterone ratio. And the first thing that I want to do is stabilize your progesterone and make sure you have enough. Okay, that's the first thing we do as a physician, stabilize the patient. Second thing we try and do is we understand why on earth they have low progesterone. Now, some women will have low progesterone because they're just initiating their cycles. It's the beginning of, of their cycles. They're in their early teens or late teens, whatever it is, and they haven't fully gotten a rhythm there. That's possible. Fine. We'll work with that. Some women, it's because they're premenopausal. And in that case, same thing. We're just giving progesterone to, to, and that's where we are with it. But if you're not, and if you're in your 20s, 30s, and, and maybe even early 40s in some cases, we want to understand why you're not ovulating. Why aren't you ovulating? And, and, and the workup on that is important. And I've mentioned this in the previous podcast. I want to mention it again. And I'll probably mention it again in future ones because it's this important. Gluten, and you can type this out. Is gluten, exorphin, I'm going to say the same one I said last time. <laughs> gluten, exorphin, B5 stimulates prolactin secretion from opiate receptors located outside the blood-brain barrier. What that means is that when we eat wheat, when we eat gluten, not all of us, some of us, definitely some of us, when we eat gluten, it'll cause us to release prolactin inappropriately. We're not talking the levels that you'd see on a tumor, okay? But we're talking enough to inhibit ovulation. That's proven, okay? And we can prove it again in you. 
So say you go to your doctor, you present to clinic and they're saying you're not ovulating, this is the cause of your breast pain. What do we do? We run the lab on that prolactin. If your prolactin is say five, six or seven, it's in the normal range. I know, I know it is. But it should be lower because as soon as you move above four or two to four, you're going to be inhibiting ovulation. The higher the number goes, the more you're inhibiting ovulation. And you can prove that in lab work. Stop eating gluten. So if I say a prolactin, if I see a prolactin with a patient being slightly elevated, say they come in, their prolactin's 10, okay? That's not a tumor. And that's they're not lactating, but 10. I will have them do a gluten-free diet and rerun the labs a month later. If the prolactin levels go down between two and four, I think I got it. And if their ovulation starts happening, if I start seeing that progesterone start popping up in the second half of the cycle, I know I got it. And then if I want to prove it one more time, I'll tell them eat gluten and let me rerun that lab on that prolactin and see what happens. Because that's how you know. I don't want to take gluten out of people's diets because I have some weird cult belief in it because there are people that have weird cult belief in gluten. I don't. I love bread. I, I have a... I make pizza for my kids once in a while. Um, I even go out to pizza. You know, I'm like, I'll eat it, okay? But some of my patients, some of my people, it will inhibit ovulation. And I've had patients, that's the way they got pregnant. That's the way they got pregnant, taking gluten out of their diet. Proven, documented in the literature, but I've seen it clinically. So one thing, prolactin levels, test it, bring it down. Or And if the prolactin is very high, it could have been a tumor, a prolactinoma. Treat it. That's another one. Sometimes when you have low thyroid, low T3, which is an epidemic, it seems like. It's very rare we see it normal these days in women. But when you see low T3, you'll also see low progesterone. They go hand in hand. So normalizing thyroid will help with progesterone as well. Stress. Stress is the devil. Stress is the devil because that's God's birth control. <laughs> when you're stressed, your body will push progesterone into cortisol instead and you will deplete progesterone. That's a natural form of birth control. That's You don't want to get pregnant when you're stressed. It goes back to our ancestors. It's been on there forever. So stress will also cause anovulatory cycles leading to more breast pain as well. So having your doctor work that up and find out where your cortisol is and just work up what's the cause of stress not easy to do with a doctor because so few doctors really take it seriously. Think about it. How many women have you heard of, and this is common, who are told they'll never get pregnant, right? And they do all the stuff they need to do to try and get pregnant, and they don't. They do all the right. And then, so they finally go and they do IVF, they have a baby, okay? And then a few months later, or a year rather, excuse me, a few years later, hopefully not a few, you don't want to get pregnant with a few months, but within a year later, they get pregnant naturally. What was that? More often than not, the cause of the infertility was stress. They weren't ovulating, which you need to ovulate to, you know, to, 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 to conceive. They weren't ovulating because of high stress. And once they had one baby down, stress levels calmed down, then they finally were able to conceive. I have patients in my clinic I see like that that have had that in their lives. And, and why didn't the fertility clinic work up stress? It's not as profitable. It's also harder to treat. You have to change lifestyle with a lot of people. You have to figure out what's the cause of their stress. So the one thing I want you to take home from this, you shouldn't have breast pain. And two, more information is available to you on your breast health than just being dismissed. And there are things you can do that are effective, that can be tested for and proven. And you deserve that. You deserve that. I hope this helps. Please like, share, and subscribe. Please know that your comments, I may not respond to every one of them. I literally read almost every single one of them still. I'm still reading all of them. Um, I try my best. You know, uh, I love doing this. I love hearing from you. This means a lot to me. When you write those comments, it gives me material that I can come back to and, 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 and try and respond to. Um, either in the texting, in the, in the, in the messaging, or, I, or it gives me ideas of what I should do a podcast on. So, so I do, it does matter to me and I do value it. So thank you. Thank you for all your feedback and thank you for tuning in. I'll see you next time.